All right, Xavier, you can go ahead and get started. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Carol. Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on your location. I don't know where you're located, where you're located right now. I hope that uh, you will enjoy this um, Sense at MIC webcast. Uh, this is a brand new presentation. Uh, first time that I present this topic. It's based on the tool that I'm using for a few months now. I really like it. So that's why I would like to share with you my, my experience. And I hope that you will you will learn a lot and you will be convinced that uh, you, we, we need such, such kind of tools. Um, so we will talk to, today about remote forensics investigations. Um, with a small subtitle in the context of COVID-19, which is to be honest, uh, uh, more something which looks like marketing because, of course, there is not a lot of uh, COVID-19 stuff inside my presentation, but I, I liked the, the idea because, yeah, we know that we are in a strange uh, state in many, many countries uh, for a few months now. So let's start. Um, yeah, switching to the correct screen will be better. Okay, so uh, a few words about myself. Of course, I need to present myself. So my name is Xavier Mertens. Uh, I'm known as XMe on Twitter. And uh, basically, I'm a freelance uh, consultant based in Belgium. Um, and I like to do some blue team activities. So I like to hunt. I like to uh, track the bad guys. I like to do some reverse engineering, malware analysis, find new techniques that I use by the bad guys and also do uh, in my day-to-day -day job I'm doing some investigations forensics um, that's why I need a nice toolbox to be able to investigate as soon as possible when a customer calls me and asks me for some assistance uh, I'm also uh, a senior handler at the internet storm center um, and I'm co-organizer of the Brucon Security Conference, uh, a very nice, very nice conference based in Belgium. But unfortunately, it has been cancelled this year because we are not sure about the situation in October. So uh, we hope to see you in 2021. Um, this presentation, we have a lot of demos. So uh, I hope that the demo god will be with me because I will switch from screen a lot of times and I will try to do some live stuff. Uh, in my, my first idea was to try, of course, to, to record videos just in case of, or in, in case of emergency, but it was really complicated because I really have to do some uh, interaction between multiple VMs. Uh, so I hope that everything will run smoothly. It was the case this afternoon when I checked for the last time my slides, so crossing fingers. Um, about so the topic, um, probably, yeah. We are living in a very strange world for a few months. So 2020 is really, really a bad year. And I hope that it will be better in a few months. But uh, this year will definitely change the way we work, the way we have contact with our peers, with customers, providers, and so on at every level. And uh, from a business point of view, uh, most of us uh, are working at home at the moment. Um, for example, I'm working at home. I, I well, hopefully in how in how fields cybersecurity, security consultancy, I'm able to work from home, to work from almost everywhere at any time. So it doesn't change a lot for me. But some of my customers uh, decided to close the offices, and basically I'm working from home for three months now, full time at home. And uh, yeah, probably this will remain a standard for the coming months. And uh, but of course, the business must continue, and we we must be able to provide our services to customers, to users when they have security security issues and they they, they call us in emergency. So basically, we need to, to to change the toolbox that we have, and we also have to adapt the different processes to be able to fulfill this brand new requirements. And the tool that I, that I will present you today is does basically exact, uh, does this in a very, very nice way. Um, probably if you are doing some uh, forensic investigation, if you are working in security operation centers, you already face the situation, you know it's Friday, 10 p.m. and suddenly your phone rings 
you are on duty and you have a customer calling you in emergency because they had between course a big issue they don't understand what's happening but they would like to receive some help and of course the customer is located far away from your office or from your home so you don't have time to take your car you can't book a flight because all the airports are closed border are closed but you need to perform investigation as soon as possible and trust me if something must go wrong, it will happen. Um, there are a lot of Murphy's Law about this, <laughs> like, like the quote that I put, everything takes longer than you think. Um, and a, a very good example is, you see on, on the right, uh, a screenshot of WannaCry, the WannaCry pop-up, the famous first uh, well-known ransomware. Basically, WannaCry started to, to infect computers I remember exactly when, because I was on duty for the Internet Storm Center this day, it was uh, on May 12, 2017. It started at uh, um, 7.44 UT UTC. So basically, attackers, they don't wait to be in business, uh, to work. they don't work only on business days, they don't work during business offices hours, because of course, for them, it's easy. If, if they can do malicious stuff, during holidays, doing big bank holidays, doing weekends, they increase the chances that it will take more time for the, the security people to react because they have reduced the staff, they are not at the office and so on. So trust me, bad things will happen and always, always at the worst moment. Um, about foreign six, I, I had to put a, a slide about foreign six 101. So uh, basically, um, I just copy paste a, a small definition from Wikipedia. The goal of computer forensic is just to examine digital media in a forensically sound manner with the aim of identifying and very important preserving, recovering, analyzing artifacts and basically what happened on the computer and how we can find evidences to make a timeline and to go back in the past and understand step by step what happened on the computer. Uh, of course, all the relevant data must be collected from the compromised host in a very safe way, especially if the goal is then to go in front of a court, you have to preserve all the evidences. And what kind of evidence are interesting? We have the basic ones, which are file system, so all the files, when the files was open, when the files were created, when the files was, was moved from a USB stick to the drive and so on, when it was downloaded. Memory, memory is a key point because everything relies in memory. The registry keys for Windows system. And also we have all useful artifacts like all the application data basically. So the browsing history, files downloaded, uh, USB sticks inserted, drivers installed, application installed, application started, deinstalled, well, connection to Wi-Fi and stuff like this. So we need to collect this kind of information. And to do this, we need a toolbox, of course. So there are plenty of toolbox available uh, on the internet and available as free tools or commercial tools. Basically, we have two cases, two situations. In a very big organization, um, big organization, they deploy in advance tools to be able to interact with infected computers in real time. And we have some kind of agent-based deployment. Uh, we have well-known commercial tools like NKs, and we have plenty of other products slash frameworks like Google Rapid Response, Mozilla Investigator, OS Query. I'm also a big fan of OSX, which can also collect a lot of stuff in real time and also interact with systems. But in many, many times, you will have to investigate a computer at a customer, uh, which is not under your control. So you don't have an agent already installed, you don't have all the facilities in place, and you need to, to work with on-demand tools. A very famous one is the SIF workstation, uh, developed by Sense, which is very nice. This live CD is able to do a lot of stuff on a computer. Uh, the goal is not to, to browse all the features and to discuss about the C4 station, but basically it's a live CD which contains a lot of tools pre-installed and based on the, with the help of those tools, you can extract a lot of artifacts from the system. Very, very, very nice tool. Um, if you don't know it, have a look at it. I use it not daily, but almost daily. I like it. But for me, there is 
an issue with C the seaforestation is the seaforestation you cannot work you cannot work easily on a remote location with the seaforestation because basically it's a live CD that has a web interface, um, a, a GUI, sorry, an, a, a Nix interface. You can, of course, SSH to it, but it missed several components to be able to be deployed quickly in a safe way and to be used uh, remotely. So we are now facing, based on what I just explained, so the the the, the, the CIFR station is, is is working properly. But for me, the requirements that must be uh, in that must be fulfilled are on this slide. First, it must be very easy and quick to deploy. Of course, remember the customer will call you at 10 p.m. He expects to have some feedback, not a complete uh, report. He doesn't wait for the complete report in two hours, but at least the customer has to know, OK, am I under attack? Is my computer comprom compromised? Yes, no. So bullet points, you need to be uh, uh, quick on the spot to, to investigate the, the, the system. Of course, the, the tools that you use must be forensically aware. So you must be able to work in a safe way without the risk to destroy some interesting evidences. Uh, tools, tools are mandatory. Uh, there are plenty of tools to do your know, forensic investigation, the FIR, there are new tools coming almost every day. So the idea is to have a tool which contains your favorite tools, of course. Uh, amongst all the uh, incident handlers and forensic people that I know, all of them use different tools. Of course, you have the classic ones, but everybody has a bunch of small Python script running somewhere in an obscure directory because he wrote them a few months ago to extract specific amount of information. So a lot of tools must be pre-installed and it's up to you to define your preferred environment. Disk management, of course, is key because most of the of the data that you will try to find in an incident management in a forensic investigation are based on disk. Interaction with users is also interesting because the the customer is expecting to to stay in contact with you and customer they like to to be kept uh, to receive notification about what you are doing, what you are finding, and a like interaction. So I mean, when I found something, I like to immediately contact the customer, the user, and say, oh, I found this, maybe, uh, did you do this? Did you do this? And so on. So interaction is very important. Of course, you don't know what you will use or what, what kind of system you will face during your investigation. So you need something which is compatible with different systems, can be a Mac, can be a Windows system, a Linux system, and you will have to connect on multiple kinds of networks. Must be, can be a corporate network, can be a simple residential ADSL, can be a wireless network, you don't know. The customer must be able to keep control. It's very important because um, when you will have to investigate a computer, this computer will never be alone. It will be connected on a network. It will be connected maybe on in the big organization. It will be connected on a production network, in a factory, when you have ICS devices, you don't know. So customers, they like to keep the control and it's very important because they will delegate you only the access that you need to perform the investigation. No more, no less. And finally, of course, low bandwidth usage because you must be able to, to work from any place. Uh, when you are at home, it's very easy because you have multiple screens, you have a night bandwidth, you have you a have lot of megabits, you have a lot of tools, but if you are on the road or if you are working somewhere else, probably you will have to work over 4G networks, you will have to open multiple VPNs and so on. So a low bandwidth usage is also a key point. And the goal, the idea is to process data remotely as much as possible. So for me, it's a nonsense to download a big memory image. If you can do the memory acquisition and process the memory image remotely and you just download the result. That's the requirements that I have in uh, to, to find the best tool uh, to do remote forensic investigation. So let's dive about the tool now. So the tool is called BitScout. Um, basically, BitScout is a, a customizable live West constructor tool almost entirely written in Bash. And I like it because it's very easy to, 
to to change, to optimize, to 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 expand. So basically, the feature that we have in this tool it's a live Linux OS, like plenty of them, like the C4 session. So you have an ISO file that you can distribute to your customers. Um, it's simple. You can customize it in many many ways, and you can also com customize it at build time, but when running on live at your customer. Uh, so if you need a specific package, you can you just download the package and you will have a, a demo later. We will be able to just grab some sysentonal tools, uh, upload them on the machine and do some nice stuff. Um, of course, minimal system requirements, uh, low bandwidth, but low bandwidth does not mean that we can use anything. We need to use a VPN because probably between the, the, the customer and myself, we have to exchange sensitive information. So, of course, privacy is a key. Um, unprivileged isolated access. So, you will see this soon. So, basically, if I'm doing investigation, that's also some kind of least privilege. So, I have only access to the disk that I need to do my investigations, no more, no less. And basically, BitScout is based on two roles. You have on one side the expert. I would say the forensic investigator and the owner, which is the customer, the owner of the system. So different key points. Um, BitScout is uh, is based on multiple layers. So you see them on the on the on the right. Uh, I will not go too deep inside the different layers, but basically you boot the live CD. Uh, the system is loaded and then we have a specific container and all the operation that we will do on the evidences will be performed from this container. So it means that the user, the, the customer, so the, the investigator, sorry, so myself, I will never have a full access to the, to the customer network. It will, the customer will only delegate access uh, based on, on my requirements, of course. If if it's if it's mandatory, there is a way to give me full access to the to the network remotely. But the goal is really to have access to the compromise system, no more, no less. And I think it's a very nice approach because, as I said, the customer keeps control of his environment. And if it's the first time that I'm doing investigation for a customer, the customer of course trusts me, but he doesn't know me, so it's better for him if access is restricted and I have only access to the compromise system and not the complete infrastructure. Uh, so it's based on multiple layers. Um, and of course, the goal of this is to prevent making, is to prevent mistakes to be sure that we will not override some evidences and alter file system with the compromised device. The architecture is quite simple. Um, so we, the, the experts between codes, myself, uh, I'm connected from almost everywhere. I just need the SSH connection to 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 connect to to the system. And um, when the live CD is booted, you see there is a, a blue screen which is controlled by the owner, and the owner has access to the screen that you see on uh, on the right, which is a very simple text interface. Based on this interface, the owner can do a lot of interesting stuff. It can delegate access to some disks. We can chat. He can supervise some commands. He can see the status of the system. He can see the status of the network. He can also configure the network by, by himself. So basically, it's up to the customer, the owner of the system, to boot the, to, to boot the live CD, to do the basic configuration, uh, configure the Wi-Fi interface, configure a proxy, configure a static IP address if he wants, or I get a dynamic uh, IP address. And once it's done, there is a VPN, which is automatically started from the live CD to the expert VPN server. And once the VPN is established, the expert can just SSH to the system and can do all the investigations. Regarding configuration and customization, um, it's very simple. Uh, the goal for you as an expert is to create your personal ISO, your personal uh, live CD, because you will use your dedicated VPN, you will use 
uh, you will configure some SSH keys, you will configure some RSC. I like RSC. I was, I'm using RSC for more than 30 years. RSC will never die, trust me. RSC is a very simple way to uh, to, to chat with, with a customer. Everything is in place, so the, the customer does even not notice that it's RSC because he just click on chat, select the option, and the window will be started automatically joining my RSC server in a specific channel, and we will be able to, to talk together about the case. Um, but so very important to be able to use this live CD, the BitScout live CD, the expert needs to deploy some server. So you need an infrastructure, you need a VPN server, you need some, may, maybe some DNS servers if you want, some proxies, IRC, syslog servers and so on. It's very, very important. But basically you see a small screenshot on, on the right, you have some basic text files and you just configure BitScout like this. So you define your IRC servers, you can install your OpenVPN keys, your SSH keys, the OpenVPN server configuration, everything. Then you build the ISO, you have an ISO file which is ready to distribute to your customers. The next point before creating your ISO file, you can also configure it if you want. So you see on, on the small screenshot that you have a lot of uh, bash scripts um and you can create your own ones so for example you see there is a change root installed forensic.sh which is a, a, a default script which is provided in the default live cd installation which contains the installation of many forensic tools and just to, in my case i created the the one just above change root install forensic extra.sh where i just installed my personal tools so you can just configure it like this you can create new bash script and when you generate the iso file using automake.sh it will create automatically in a few minutes the in a few minutes well the first time you you create the image it can take a long a long time but then it will only update the what you change and in a few minutes you have a new version of your iso file which is ready to be uh, deployed and to, to to be ready to make available to your customers um, once a customer contact you and you need you need to, to do some investigation, it's simple. You just provide, so for example, my customers, they have a link and they are able to download the ISO file from a website. I also provide some documentation where I explain how it works and what they have to do. Basically, first, they just have to burn the CD or they have to generate a USB stick or even more today when we have more and more virtualization, in case of uh, an ES6 server, they just put the ISO file in the data store, they boot a VM, they can boot the compromised server using a specific uh, ISO file at boot time, so a CD, or you can just create, the customer is able to create a specific VM and it just assign the suspicious VMDK, so the disk file to the VM, just boot it, and uh, the VPN will open. That's why, of course, some internet access is required. So it's very important for the customer to, uh, to provide him the minimum network requirements, the host name and IP address of your VPN server. Uh, probably the, the, also the, the VM must be able to resolve some names and so on. So you have, you have to provide basic network settings. So if the, the VM or if the compromised host does not have an automatic access to the internet, it should be able to configure a firewall or to do some ACLs to allow internet access. Of course, it's important. Then the next step is to do the network setup. Um, network setup is very easy. So you, based on your environment, you define if you, by default, it will try to fetch an IP address via DHCP. If it's not the case, you can configure a static IP address, you can configure a proxy, you can configure a SOX proxy, you can configure also a syslog, which is very interesting. So usually I ask them to configure my own syslog server. So uh, I, I'm able to get in real time a copy of all the events and so on. Uh, and you can also activate over Wi-Fi. So if you are on a laptop, if you are investing in investigating a laptop, you can use the Wi-Fi uh, connection from the, um, the laptop. You can configure a WVAP key, web key, whatever you want. So it's completely uh, compatible with any kind of network. 
And when it's, the network is established, a few seconds later, the open VPN will automatically phone home and the expert will be able to connect on the VPN. So in my case, I'm just, I just, or I just use, I'm using a specific SH key. So the public key is pre-installed on the live CD. So using a specific key, I just SSH to the, to the system and I'm ready to do my job. So this is time, it's time for the first demo. So I will boot the system. I will show you how it works and how the VPN is coming up and how you can access to the system. So crossing fingers, it's the first demo. So this is my BitScout server, uh, my test virtual machine. So basically it's a, a virtual machine. And on this machine, I just attach a VMDK, which is a compromised Windows 7 system. And this is my Ubuntu machine from where I will do all the tests. So let's boot the system. You will see it's very simple. It's very quick. You don't have to change anything. It's booting. There we go. And in the meantime, I will ping my my VPN. So that's the, 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 the IP address of my VPN. So the, the, the VPN client, which will be connected via the live CD. The system already booted. So you see that it's very convenient, it's very easy. And the customer see this kind of system. So it can shut down the system. It can start a shell on the system. It can start a shell inside the container. Oh, you see the VPN is up. So my VPN just started and now the system is connected and I will be able to SSH to it. Uh, you can chat, you can supervise, you can see a status, you can see the disk information. We will come back to all this menu in a few minutes. And for example, network, you see that you can do some Cisco configuration. You can configure a SOX proxy, an HTTP proxy. You can put a static IP. You can enable access from the LAN. So basically by default, the container has no access to the complete environment of the customer, very important. But if the customers agree, it can give you access to complete land, which could be interesting. For example, if you have very, very, very big files to store somewhere, the customers may say, okay, on this system, you have a SMB share, you can access it, or you have SMB share, FTP server, feel free to drop, to drop some files, some evidence on this system. Why not? And Wi-Fi settings, you see that you can have, by default, that I don't have any wireless, but you can configure everything you want. It's very convenient. So this is my expert system. So I will leave my, my VM. So just assume that this VM is running 500 kilometers away from my system. And now I can just SSH to the system using my key. The user by default is user, quite simple. Here you go, I am my system. So it's a classic Windows, uh, Linux system. So if all the tools that you have, you, you see that of course the system has in this case an internet access, which is not going through the VPN by default. And of course, you can switch to, you can become root, and then you have, you have a complete system, you have complete access. But this session, so user at Bitscode, I'm in a container. So I'm not running on the live CD, I'm running in a container which has limited access. I don't have access to all the tools and I don't have access to the complete infrastructure. That was the first demo. So you see, oh, it worked, you just boot the system, a few seconds ago, you get, a VPN connection and you can SSH back to the, to, the, to the system. The key point of BitScode is disk management. So it's also a task which, is, which must be performed by the, the, the customer. The customer, of course, he knows the system. So the idea of the disk management, the customer keeps the control and it will delegate you access only to the system that you need to investigate. So I will show you a, a live demo, but basically let's assume that we have a slash dev slash SDA on the system. That's what you see on, on the screenshot. You have two partitions, SDA1, SDA2, which are two NTFS partitions. 
And the idea behind this is to do mappings. So a mapping is a very key element of Bitscode because the mapping, you will never work with slash dev slash SDA, you will work with evidence moon point, with evidence devices. So the ID for the customer is to map slash dev slash SDA into slash dev slash or slash evidence something. And it's up to the customer to decide if the mapping will be read write or read only, which is very convenient. So you are sure that you will not break any evidence, you will not break any system. And let's have a look immediately. So that's the second demo. I'm back to the system of the customer. Let's go to the disk system. And we, the first thing to do is to view the available block devices. So in this case, so I attach the VMDK of a Windows system, Windows 7 system. So we have slash dev slash SDA, and you see two partitions, NTFS, SDA1, SDA2. The ID is now to do some mapping. So mapping is very easy. First, you select what you want to map. You can map an entire disk. You can map only your partitions. So in this case, let's select the first disk. So the complete disk slash SDA, which is a 30 gigs drive. And then you map it to an evidence. You see that you have two types of uh, mapping. If you map to evidence zero to evidence nine, you have a read-only access. And if you map from storage zero to storage nine, you have read-write access. Let's use evidence zero, go, successfully mapped. And now you see that I have a mapping in place, slash dev slash SDA, which is mapped to evidence zero. And now if I'm on my system, if I do MMLS slash dev post evidence zero, you see the disk. F disk, add slash dev, uh, host, Evidence zero, you see all the systems. So NTFS file system and so on. Nice, isn't it? Did I miss something if I forgot demo? Blah 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 blah. Yeah, no, we will let's mount the system. So I will mount only a partition, so we do a second mapping because you can have of course multiple mapping. In this case, I will mount the Windows system, uh, so the, the, the C drive, which is on SDA2. I will mount it to evidence one. You see that evidence zero disappear because it's already mapped to something else. Here we go. And now I can mount the file system because so for some tools we'll have you can work directly on the file system on the block device, but some tools they will try to work on uh, file systems. So let's do some tests. Javier victim on Row the first evidence one within and we have a Windows 7. You you recognize a Windows system, Windows, recycled bin, system for information, program files, and so on and so on and so on. So now we have a map to this draft. And if I do a touch XXX. You see that it's read-only file system, so I cannot break anything. Now that we mount our disk, so we have access on in a safe way to disk, we can use the classic, invest, we can start the classic investigations. The goal of this presentation is not to explain you how to do investigations. So I will just show you some tool, you, I will show you some tool and you will see that they work basically like on any uh, like on any system, if you use SIFT workstation, for example, you have the same tools. So the goal is not to, to let those tools run the complete analysis, it's just to show that it works so simply. So let's have a look at, uh, for example, uh, log to timeline. So you can start a log to timeline uh, in uh, slash TMP. Uh, I will do uh, win seven dot plazo and I will scan my victim. You 
it started. So that's a classic log to timeline tool. It's analyzing the system. You see that it works, blah, blah, blah. It found a lot of stuff, common files, page file.sys, and so on. Okay, let's stop it. It's enough. Control C. And then I have now my Win7 puzzle file here, and I can do a P sort. O uh, L to time nine CSV for example uh, V right uh, Win seven dot CSV Win seven dot Plazo there you go whoops analysis completed very quick because I have a very small Plazo file CSV and you find your evidences as usual uh, you can also for example so look to timeline so the tools the plus tools are installed by default but one of the tools that i like to use is for example bulk extractor this tool is not installed by default uh on uh, on bits code but i like it so what i did as i show you a few minutes ago you can create a script which will install your own tools your preferred tools and you can do some uh some checks so Let's search for bulk extractor. I will do like this. Oops. Copy. There we go. Oh, sorry. Bulk extractor. I need to go to uh, to 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 SRC. There we go. We keep it running a few seconds again. Okay, blah, 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 stop, TMP, bulk, and you see that we have the classic files, so if found JPEG files, JSON, RAW files, PYY, SQL Lite, and so on and so on. So basically, once you mapped all your drives, you can use all your classic tools, your preferred tools as you want. That was the demo number three. No. It's nice because you know, we, you, you know that you see that you can mount some disk, but sometimes it's better to work on a live system because you have to install the very specific tools. First, probably that are not re running on, um, on, uh, on the Linux system. For example, if you would like to run some FTK major FTK tools, you have to, to, to run them on the Windows system. But again, you have to preserve evidences. Bitscode comes with QMU pre-installed and uh, I will show you how you can mount and you can boot the infected system in two steps. And once again, preserving all the evidence so you will not break everything. The idea behind this is just to use the snapshot feature of QMU to snapshot the mapped disk, and then we'll boot the VM using the snapshot as main storage. This is the, the, the next demo. So the first step, we have to create the, the snapshot. So remember that my disk, so I, I, I mapped two disks. I mapped view, I mapped the complete drive slash dev slash SDA to evidence zero. So we need to boot the file system, so we need the complete disk. So what I will do now, oops, let's go. I will do my, uh, where is it? Ah, oh, wait, I need to type my comments. I don't have it right here. Two seconds. So the first thing is to create a snapshot. So we will use QME, Q, QME image create. We will use the format QCO2, which allows to have snapshots which are re, uh, re, read writable. I will create my snapshot back in file slash the post evidence zero at this, at this time because I need to, uh, to, to use a complete disk. Back to format, it's a raw device. 
and I will create my uh, snapshot in evidence one dot q go to. Here we go. It's very simple. So what does this command? It starts from the host evidence zero, which is in format row, and it cre it will create a QQ file a QQ file two, which is a snapshot of my system. So it means that the snapshot will be used to boot the VM, and the VM will be able to change because when you boot uh, an OS, the OS need to read write access to the file system. So no, let's let's start the the VM, which is a very nice command line, like this. So basically. You create the file system with all the devices. Uh, no, no, it's no, not zero. It's the bad file. It's evidence one. Here we go. So queuing is booting, and what I what I will do now, you tab, I will create a new session. I will zoom to the view, zoom in, zoom in, SSH minus E, I will use my same key, but now what I will do, I will have the port mapping. Tab, GVNC viewer. Here we go. So what we do? We booted the machine, and QEMU has a very nice uh, console available via VNC. So I started a second session from my master system to the to the container. I mapped the default port for VNC. And then I started a connection on the loopback, and this is my live system. This is my Windows 7 system. So basically, this system is running in a QEMU on my Biscode, uh, in my Biscode container using the uh, snapshot based on the image mapped in read-only. So I, ne I don't change any bit on the file system on the disk. And if you boot it, you see that it's a complete working system. I'm able to boot it and to do some uh, some investigation, and then you can okay, yeah, it's not activated. It's a uh, it's a, a just a demo system, but the system is completely live, and you can if it's for example uh, if you have some malware files to check of if you are analyzing a malware and the malware expects some activities on the system and so on. You can boot it and you can simulate everything you want. So you can really boot your live system in the container in this only through SSH session. So everything is running on this VM, which is here. Nothing else. That was this demo. The next one, memory analysis. If we can boot a VM, it means that doing memory acquisition for a VM is very convenient, very easy. So usually memory analysis is also very important because you can find plenty of key artifacts inside the memory. So it's very a key element in, uh, in forensic investigations. But in a normal way, performing memory acquisition is a pain because more and more you have a bigger and bigger memory size. Today, you have minimum 32 gigabytes of e or, or in common laptops. My, my MacBook has 64 gigs. So can you imagine if you take an image of 64 gigs and then you have to transfer the image to a VPN, to a shell, a SCP, FTP, somewhere to do some investigation. We can do the same in this case using QMU. So if I go back to my QMU system here, I can just dump my guest memory into TMP win7.dump. Here we go. Done. I, I took my memory image. I 
I have mined them. So my VM is very small. Yeah, the, the Windows 7 has only one gigabyte of memory, but this is my VM. And guess what? Volatility is installed. So I will not demonstrate you how, how volatility is working and so on, but you have the memory image, you have volatility, everybody is running in the container on the live CD. So you can do your investigation, you can extract your payloads, you can extract your, your logs, you can extract your process list, your open files, your, your, your network flows. You can save everything to files and you just transfer the result. This is the key point. You transfer only the result of the investigations to the expert system and everything, all the big data that you have to process remains at the customer side. So memory analysis is the same. Memory acquisition, so it's just simple as a command. You don't have to deploy a tool. You don't have to copy all the files. So you will not alter the memory of the system because you don't install anything on the running computer. We, we need, we can also go um, a little further. Sometimes you will need some very specific tools, for example, system tools. Sys, with Microsoft Sys Internals has plenty of tools that you can uh, that you can uh, use to, 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 for example, to dump processes, to, to investigate the, all the, I don't know, uh, the DLL used by an application and so on. So once again, QMU to the rescue. So in this case, what we will do, inside the container, we have a specific host only network which is dedicated to local communications. The idea behind this, we will boot again the machine, but in this case, we will create a SMB share, which will be available on the Windows system, and we will be able to copy files on this share and to install extra application or to install or transfer files through SMB on the VM. So that's the next demo. So to do this, I need to kit my existing system. So I will, I will just break the machine like this. And I need to do something else. I need to ABT get updates. And I will just install Samba because Samba is not installed by default in this in this version of my uh, my ISO file at the moment. I still need to upgrade it. So ABT get install Samba. Oops. No. So it's a standard Samba installation. Okay, blah, 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 blah. Almost done. Come on. Here we go. Let's create a, a, a small share slash SMB, for example, like this. And now I will boot again my VM, but I will use it. I will show you some extra parameters. I will zoom this. Uh, I will show this on the screen. Oops. See, it's a very nice command line, so it's impossible to remember this by heart. So basically, what we do here, you see that we have a specific network, and we had a specific SMB path, and we start the SMB server, which will be on 10023. So basically, the network 1002 something is a host only network used inside the container. The, we say that the Windows system will be 10023 and the SMB server will be 10024. And we will just boot the system and we, have, we will have a network share. I need to change evidence again. It's evidence one here, like this. And let's boot the system again. Uh, but could be paste. Okay. Whoa. Oh. Sorry. 
There we go. I restart my GNC. We know, of course, Windows said that it, not, it does not boot it properly because I did a very bad shutdown. Takes a few seconds. I saw that there are a lot of questions. Um, the presentation is almost over, so I will review the questions just after the slides and I will reply to them. No worries. The system boots usually a little slower because uh, we are running in memory on, uh, on the Docker, so the system is quite I don't assign a lot of CPU and a lot of memory to the to the uh, to the system, but okay. So once again, keep in mind that what's what's I'm what I'm doing here. I don't touch the disk. I don't change any bit on the VMDK file on the disk. Everything is mapped in read only, and I'm using the snapshot. The snapshot helps the operating system to create temporary files, to generate the page files, because the operating system needs read-write access, of course, to boot properly. Come on. Get the nice pop up from Microsoft. No, I don't want to activate. So if no, I'm doing this. Oops. Oh, come on. Sorry. Up this. Then you do four. You see, I have a QM share, which is empty. Okay, let's do something interesting now. I will open a new, a new tab. I pre-downloaded process explorer.zip. So what I will do, I will just copy my process explorer.zip in my share. Sage C cert process explorer.zip to user at bitscape.p. I don't have access. Okay. Done. Well, I go to my slash SMB that I created and I move process right here. Here we go. Process Pro is available, so we can deploy it, we can run it, we can install it, we can do more investigation. So if you have your preferred tools, running only on Windows operating systems, it's not an issue. Just create a snapshot, boot the VM, and you can just install them, use them, play with your tool, your favorite tools, and so on. Very, very convenient. That was the demo number six. We have, that was, it's enough for the demos, so we have other interesting features to, to wrap up the slides. Uh, as I already mentioned, you can chat between the owner and the expert. So for me, communication is key. So um, only by selecting an option in the menu, the owner will be able to contact the expert through IRC, uh, everything through the VPN. So it means that you can chat safely, you can request some password, you can request sensitive information to the customer, the customer can reply and so on. Everything is safely encrypted. The IRC server is mine, running on my infrastructure, so it's completely safe. Uh, it's running in the Docker, by the way. So chatting is uh, also a very nice uh, feature. Another one is the command approval. Sometimes um, you can enter a specific shell. So you see that on, on the left, if you type, if you type supervised shell, all the commands that you will type must be approved by the reviewer. So once again, it's a way for you to give more power and to prove to the customer that is or she is important. And uh, basically, the on the console that you see on the right, every time you type a command, 
you will get the pop-up and the customer, the owner of the system, is able to allow or reject the command. So it keeps control of what you are doing. Of course, you can use the power of SSH. Everything that I made, you saw that I, I just SSH to the container to do my operations, but you can, of course, do something else. For example, if you really would like to get the, the drive, to get an image of the disk locally to transfer it, you can do it through SSH, through Netcat, and you just create a specific reverse shell, and you, you do NC, uh, you do, N, uh, um, you cat, of evidence, host evidence zero, you gzip and you do the and you do the end cat to the specific port, it will go through the SSH, through the VPN, and automatically you will receive it on, on your export system. Okay, it will be very slow, it will take time, especially if you have a lot of gigabyte to transfer, but you can do it. Even more, if you don't, if you would like to, to download some files and uh, you don't want the user the customer to see what you are downloading. One of my favorite trick is just to SSH to the system using a reverse shell. So you see the minus BR 21, 31, uh, 3128, which is the port, the default port used by, uh, by Squid. Then you define an HTTP proxy environment, which points to the reverse shell. And basically, all the HTTP requests that I will do if I need to download some packages, to download some files and so on, everything will go back to my SSH session, so it will be hidden from the customer perspective, so you will, you will not leave some traces in this firewall, logs, proxy logs, and stuff like this. So you can basically use all the power of Netcat SSH, and it's very, very convenient. Very important about BitScode. So I'm not the developer of BitScode. It's not my baby. So it has been developed and it's maintained by Vitalik Kamluk, uh, which is a very nice guy. And basically, in this code, I'm just a simple contributor to the project. So I already submitted some changes to the Git repository, and I contributed. I like it, and that's why I, I asked to, to Vitalik if he, if he agreed for if I agree to have some presentation based on this baby on this code he agreed of course and if you want to try it to use it everything is online in uh, on on this github repository uh, so feel free to download it customize it test it and play it and i hope that you will enjoy it that was my presentation so i i saw that there are plenty of questions interesting questions we still have a few minutes so i will do a quick review and uh, reply to them so, um, first question, can we get the slides? Yes, of course. I already provided the slides to Sans, and Carol will do her best to, to put them somewhere. I, but it will be communicated, but slides will be online. Yes. If you ever, if you ever add an attacker, disable your Quinsel.62 set. Uh, no, because, well, no, generally. But in this specific case of BitScode, you don't have any forensic tool set installed on the system because you are just emulating, uh, you, you are just accessing the, the disk via a mapping or you just boot the VM via the, the, the snapshot. So for an attacker, the, the attacker, you don't install anything on the system, no agent, no files. So the, for, for the attacker, it's completely, the, the attacker is blind, basically. Are there any accommodation in the case of ransom or descriptive where? Um, um, if you search on Google, um, so Vitaly and a friend of, uh, and one of his, uh, his, his friends, they made a very interesting presentation at Hack in the Box a few years ago, where they explain how to get some uh, recovery key techniques of ransomware to the, all the techniques that I explained uh, tonight. So yes, you can you can investigate ransomware through the through the Bitscope. Uh, how does Bitscope cope with BitLocker drives? Um, good question. It's also possible. So same Vitalik they made uh, and and his friend they made a very nice demo. Basically, when you boot a QEMU, you can boot it in uh, in stand-up mode, so in, uh, in 
it will not automatically start the, um, the VM. Then you can attach a debugger and you can dump interesting information and they explain how to recover the BitLocker key. And then you can, once you get the, the, the BitLocker key, you can apply all the well-known techniques to decrypt the drive and boot the drive. So it's completely doable, yes. Um, presentation. Thank you. Can you describe the login functionality of the tool? Login functionality. So that that was that was one of my submission to the repository. Um, you you can define. So the customer is able to define a specific syslog server. So everything will be sent to his own syslog server. So it's another way for the customer to 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 be aware of what's happening on the system, what you are doing. But you can also, by default, you can specify when you build your ISO file, you can specify your own syslog server and you will get a copy of everything. Specifically, the bish, the, the, bish, the, the bash shell that is running on the live CD has been recompiled with syslog support. So every command that you, that you type in your bash shell will be sent to the syslog server, which is very nice because first for you, it's a log file. It's also, you can also gain evidences and you will not miss interesting information. So for me, I like it because I, I'm very bad at writing, I'm writing down what I did. And if all the commands that I type in my bash shell are automatically sent to my syslog server slash my Splunk server, uh, it means that I have an history of everything and I don't have to take care. Oh, okay, how did that, oh, which command did I type to do this? Which was the parameter for this command and so on? Everything is locked. Um, how can you interact with the machine's memory and not, oh, I, wait, I can see the question completely, I need to, to zoom the window. Wait. Uh, sorry, I can read the complete question regarding the memory. Uh, if you want, just... Uh, Send me a mail with your question and we, I, I will answer it because I don't see the complete question. Um, are there other VPN options besides OpenVPN? At this moment, no. But uh, as you saw, you can customize everything. Everything is based on packages and based on shell script. So if you want to deploy your own VPN uh, solution, feel free to do. So, okay, that was the last question. So I'm just a few minutes over. But I hope that you enjoy the presentation. Uh, of course, feel free to get in touch with me if you need more information, if you, if you need more demos and stuff like this. I hope that you enjoyed the presentation. And for me, it's not over. Thank you very much.